What if God's plan for your life is an interruption to your plan for your life and you have to make a choice? I'm gonna lead you through or to that choice this morning. I'm gonna assume that all of us believe that God has a plan for our life, that his plan's perfect. It's a plan that he didn't design to hurt us. He designed to, to give us this hope and peace and a future to live a life investing in things that matter, getting to the end without regret and moving on to heaven where we see Jesus with his arms outstretched saying, welcome home. You were good and you were faithful. But what if God's plan for your life interrupts your plan for your life? What if you have to make a choice? We're gonna be talking about that today and looking at the Christmas story. And I'm also gonna teach you a little bit about angels this morning because angels played a really important part in the Christmas story. And you probably have heard the story many, many times. If you've been around church, if you grew up in church, uh, man, the story is so familiar that sometimes we miss some of the significance or some of the importance. And so today I wanna look at the significance of this story and we're gonna look at life through the eyes of Mary. And we're gonna discuss the reality that sometimes God's plans for our life, they disrupt our plans for our life. But if we're willing to live a life of uncommon faith, it's always better. Richard Dawkins tried to answer a question about why things happen and was very fatalistic. As a matter of fact, it's a, a quote that he is famous for that's made uh, quite a, a bit of, of traction in universities and in the scholarly communities here in recent years. And it's very bleak, but it's a very common perspective or worldview. And I wanna read it to you uh, and contrast this with what our worldview is what the Bible has to say. In a universe of electrons and selfish genes, blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt, other people are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice. The universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect. If there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, no nothing, but pitiless indifference, it's just luck why difficult things happen, why bad things happen, why good things happen. He supposes or proposes that we live in a world that's created or set up to validate this theory. However, the writer of Ecclesiastes through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit has a much different perspective. He has made everything beautiful, God has, in its time. He's also set eternity in the human heart Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. And what this means is very simple, that God has a plan and that he's impressed in us deep within our heart, eternity and the importance of us living for a life that we don't experience right now, the life that's going to come after this one's gone. And if we arm ourselves with this worldview, it allows us to live a life of uncommon faith that leads us to and through many of the pitfalls others face and toward this significance that we're talking about. A few questions, statements to prime the pump as we get started. The first one is that there's a difference between questioning God and asking God a question. You're gonna see Mary ask a very important question without actually questioning God. You can ask God all sorts of questions, how, why, when, but we never wanna question the fact that God is powerful enough, that he's strong enough, that he's loving enough, that he's holy enough, that God's more than enough. We're the ones who, well, we're not enough. Our faith isn't supposed to move God toward our plan. Our faith is supposed to move us toward God's plan, to connect us to something that we can't find on our own. I never struggle in life and you never struggle to make sense of the good things that happen to us. We just assume we have them coming, but we struggle to make sense of the bad things that happen. When bad things happen, we assume we can't possibly be in God's plan because God would only allow or will good things to happen to us. And what you're going to see is that through Mary's life, she had some great things happen to her and some devastating things happen to her. And all of it was part of God's plan for her life. What if God's plan for your life isn't the same as your plan for your life? What if it causes you to have to make a choice? The angel went to Mary in the book of Luke to tell her that Jesus' story was finally going to intersect with our story, with her story, to bring context to all of the chaos and into the silence of the 500 years between the last Old Testament prophet and the birth of Jesus. 
to reveal the eternity that's been hidden in your heart and my heart. And it started in this great story about the birth of Jesus. But let's look at this birth through the eyes of Mary. Now, Mary was a girl. She was obviously a girl who was highly favored by God, but she was just a girl. She was from a small town called Nazareth in the middle of nowhere. And she had small town, little girl aspirations. She lived in a town where her mother had lived and her grandmother and most likely her great, great grandmother. And her goal and her dream in life would have been to live the same kind of life that they did, to invest and contribute to the town that they came from, to get married and have children and to die knowing that she had contributed, but to her own little world, her own little community, her own little peace. And God had so much more in mind and Mary had no idea. That's the way God works. Every day is the same until one day is not. And in this case, the angel came and let Mary know some things were gonna happen and no day was ever the same after that. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. Now, Galilee was in the northern part of Israel. Judea was in the southern part. The two different uh, areas or regions didn't really like each other. It wasn't just like Ames and Des Moines. It was sort of a difference in culture and even the way that they spoke. And you're going to see them going back and forth. And you'll understand why if you know a little bit more about the history. But Nazareth was, was was up in the north. It was a small little town. And it just simply says, the Bible does, that, that um, Joseph was pledged to, to be married uh, to a woman and she was a virgin. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and just said, greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now, Mary is pretty smart. And she didn't just immediately jump to the assumption that this was good news. She didn't immediately say because the angel is speaking to her and the angel said, hey, guess what? Um, God is with you. She didn't immediately think her life was gonna get better, that things were gonna, gonna take a turn for, for you know, let me just show you. She says, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and she asked a great question to herself. She wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Is it good news? Is it bad news? Because after all, when you realize that God's plan for your life isn't necessarily your plan for your life, and you have to decide what you're going to do with the interruption, well, it brings all kinds of emotion. And Mary was human, just a little girl who was trying to take it all in. But the angel said to her, don't be afraid, Mary. You found favor with God. You will conceive and you'll give birth to a son and you're gonna call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom never ends. So the angel drops this bomb on Mary and Mary realizes that her life is never going to be the same. Now I find it, it interesting that the angel didn't ask Mary, what do you think, Mary? Would you like to sign up and list in this, this life journey to be the mother of Jesus, to, to raise the Messiah, the son of God, to be responsible? And it just said, this is what's gonna happen and dropped it right there. And you and I, we think it was great news. We look at Mary and we think, what an easy life. How much fun could it be to be Jesus' mom? I mean, it was all roses, right? I mean, you're raising the perfect child who never sinned. But I wanna show you how God's plan for Mary's life, well, it wasn't all roses. And that in fact, it took 33 years for her to realize that God was keeping his promise, that he is faithful, and to finally have her questions answered. So Mary's life was interrupted. And when it was interrupted, it was interrupted in a way that she could never turn back the clock. I mean, she was off on a journey. And as this angel interrupted her, uh, she had this baby and it was a miracle. And, and she had never been with a man. And we all know about that birth. And she loved this little baby. And Mary and Joseph were devout parents. 
At eight days, they took Jesus to the temple. It was only, by this time they were in Bethlehem, it was only about six miles away. They could leave in the morning and get there in the afternoon. And they took Jesus to the temple at 40 days. They took him back to the temple and they were so excited. They decided apparently to move to, to Bethlehem. And we know that they were there for probably a couple of years. We don't know why, but we know they'd moved from a stable to a house. And, and uh, we know that, that eventually the Magi came, the wise men, and you and I, we always think that the wise men showed up right there where Jesus was born because we put the little stick figures right next to the manger and the little baby Jesus. And it just wasn't true. It was probably two years after Jesus was born. Mary and Joseph were likely in a house. People don't know exactly, but Joseph may have already had a job working there as a carpenter. They were creating a life. The wise men, they stopped and talked to Herod. And Herod said, hey, I heard that there's a king born who's gonna threaten my throne. And I want you guys to go and of course worship this baby. Tell him I said hi, but then come back and let me know where he is. I may wanna go worship as well. So the wise men, they were wise. They went and they found Jesus and they worshiped and presented their gifts. But they didn't go back to Herod because they knew that he was up to something. They slipped away, went back to their homes outside of the grasp and reach of Herod himself. But Herod still heard. So an angel came to Joseph again in a dream and said, you got to go. You got to take Jesus and you got to get out of here. So he left, he went to Egypt and you may think Egypt's a long way away. Egypt must've been at least 390 miles away. I mean, Cairo was forever away, but that's not really what the Bible was talking about. Egypt had expanded its territory so much that really it would only have been about 40 miles from Jerusalem or from Bethlehem that they would have to have traveled to be outside Herod's grasp. And so Joseph and Mary and Jesus took off and they went out where Herod couldn't mess with them. And now can you imagine Mary, a mother, Many of you are mothers, knowing that the most powerful man in the kingdom wanted to kill your son and was preparing to send his troops, his death squad, to hunt you down and to destroy the baby who you love more than life itself. Sounds like roses, doesn't it? An easy life, the mother of Jesus. So they're in Egypt and nobody knows how long they were in Egypt. Some people say two years, some say just a few weeks. We don't really know, but we do know that Herod followed through on his promise, that he sent his henchmen to Bethlehem and killed perhaps dozens of little baby boys, two years and under, trying in fact to kill Jesus so that he wouldn't threaten his power, his, his throne. So can you imagine Mary and the mixed emotions of a mom knowing that the son who you loved had been spared, but then connecting through empathy, through, through just human decency to the families, perhaps dozens of families around Bethlehem who lost their sons. The guilt she would feel because of their loss and the guilt that you feel because you didn't lose, but yet at the same time, your son is safe. So they could return, but they didn't return back to Bethlehem. They returned to Nazareth. Nobody really knows why they left Nazareth in the first place. Maybe it was nosy neighbors and family members they didn't really enjoy who just weren't believing this whole immaculate birth thing. Nobody knows, but they go back because Herod's relative was in charge and they still thought maybe he would make a move on baby Jesus. So think about this, not through the sanitized version of the pages that we read or the stories that we hear, but through the human condition as if you were going through this yourself. Jesus is just a toddler and Mary has already experienced every emotion that any mother could ever experience to the full. We don't see a lot or hear a lot about Jesus between the time that he was a baby and a toddler until the time he began his ministry. There are all sorts of false gospels that talk about stories of Jesus and how he parted waters and did miracles and smited and smoted kids that didn't agree with them. It's all false, it's just folklore. But there's one story that we hear. Jesus was 12 and Mary and Joseph were going from Nazareth back to Jerusalem, which was a much greater journey, perhaps 90 miles. It would have taken several days. And they went and they celebrated the Passover like they were supposed to. And then they took off 
to go back home, got a day's journey outside of Jerusalem, and then they realized, where is Jesus? A 12-year-old. Can you imagine Mary having to answer to God? Oh God, I lost Jesus. I mean, that, you have one job, Mary, right? Don't lose Jesus. And Jesus is gone. So what did they do? In, like any parent, they took off back to Jerusalem and they looked for three days. Where in the world would you look for Jesus? On a playground? Go to church, right? Took them three days to go to church. They found Jesus hanging out, asking questions, answering questions discussing the law. And Mary kind of scolds him. She's like, Jesus, you scared us to death. I mean, you're a great kid, but don't do this to us. And Jesus looks up at her and with respect, he said, listen, I have to be about my father's business. I've been called to something else. You're my mom, but it's not the same anymore. And one side of Mary would have been so proud. And the other side of Mary as any parent is when their child begins to grow up, to mature, to step out, heartbroken at the same time. So then Jesus pops up, ministry, 30 years old, doing what it is God the Father has called him to do. Mark chapter three, we read about this story. Jesus has started saying things that trouble people, like, I'm the Messiah, I'm God. And people didn't like hearing that from Jesus. So the Pharisees and the religious leaders, they accused Jesus of working for Satan. They said, you are a liar, you're a deceiver, you're demon-possessed, and you're working with the devil. That's a pretty hard thing to say about Jesus, isn't it? Mark chapter 3 talks about the unpardonable sin. It's really interesting. The Bible says you can be forgiven for any curse or insult that you utter, but when you decide that Jesus Christ is not the Son of God, and if he's not the Son of God and who he says he is, he's clearly evil. If you make that decision and you die without reversing that conclusion, that's the unpardonable sin, dying without Christ. That's the only sin you can't be forgiven for. And the Pharisees said, you are of the devil. So here come Jesus' family. Now, I know some people, they think that Jesus didn't have a family, that Mary was a virgin her whole life. Well, her other children would have wanted to argue with you about that because the Bible's super clear that Jesus had half-brothers and sisters. Mary was highly favored. God chose her for a life of significance, but she was a woman like any other woman. So Jesus' siblings and Mary traveled to Jesus, intervened, with the Pharisees and the religious elite who were saying, this man is of Satan. And instead of saying, no, he's not of Satan, he's who he says he is, they said, no, he's just crazy. His own family said that. Now, can you imagine Mary with her children? The Bible literally says she and her children tried to save Jesus from himself, to take him by force back to their home and the way they described him, particularly Jesus' siblings, we aren't sure how Mary was feeling at the time, said he's literally standing outside himself. So the Pharisees say he's of Satan. Can you imagine a mother hearing that about their son? The brothers and sisters say, no, he's just crazy. He's off his rocker. And Jesus saying, no, I am who I say I am. And you'll see. Did Mary have a life? of ups and downs, of great highs and great lows, of meaningful and significant worship and sheer terror and disappointment. What happens when God's plan for your life, what well, interrupts your plan for your life? So you fast forward a few years later and Mary hears that her son's been arrested for a crime he didn't commit. You stand as a mother and you watch your son be tortured and ultimately put to death. You watch him take his last breath and you ask God, is this your plan for my life? It took her 33 years for Jesus to rise again, to defeat sin, Satan, and death once and for all, to provide the way for us to be forgiven our sin, to have peace and hope and significance in this life. 33 years for her to see 
But in the meantime, boy, she felt, and she felt deeply. Mary saw the worst possible things happen to the best possible person. And I've heard this quote a lot, but she also saw the worst possible things happen to herself. And I look at this and it makes me wonder why it is that we get so frustrated with the bad things that happen in our lives. And we assume that when difficult things happen, it can't possibly be part of God's plan. Because God's plan, as I understand it, involves tremendous highs and sometimes tremendous lows. But the peace that passes all human understanding as we step out in faith and choose to live this way is the reason you and I were created in the first place. We're gonna finish the story in a few minutes. All right, so angels play a really important part of the birth of Jesus. And we see angels show up in a couple different ways. One of the ways or one of the times is when the angel came to John, John the Baptist's dad, Zachariah, as he was taking his rotation in the temple as a priest, burning incense, the angel came to him and said, hey, you're going to have a baby. Now, he said, no way, we're not going to have a baby because my wife, she's too old. Um, probably not a great thing to say, but he was put on the spot. The angel was there. So he said it and the angel said, yes, you are going to have a baby. And by the way, because you didn't believe, you're not going to be able to talk until your baby's born. So he walks out of the temple, making up sign language he didn't know, trying to communicate with people. Everyone's like, he must have seen a ghost. Now they thought they had a spiritual vision, a spiritual experience, they didn't know what it was. And so he goes back home. Sure enough, Elizabeth has a baby. We read about that a minute ago, and it's a relative of, of Jesus. We don't know exactly what the, the relation is. King James Version tells you, but they're not always right. Um, but it's a relative of Jesus. Now. We also see, as I've mentioned before, the angels come to Joseph, at least well, two times we see the angel come to Mary. The angels came to the shepherds. But we don't know a lot about angels. We are confused sometimes about angels. So we're gonna do a quick little um, quiz, uh, a little game, and I have a, a prize for the person who wins. It is, can anybody guess? An angel food cake, right. Um, this cake came from Walmart, $5.50. I was paying for it myself, so that's what you get. But it did come last night, so if you're into angel food cake, it's fresh from the Walmart bakery. Uh, I need two um, volunteers, and I think we've selected two from the Cinerigi family. Is that correct? We have two from the Cinerigi family. Perfect, perfect. Sean, I thought Heather was going to come with you. No chance, huh? Not, to, not today. All right, well, that's all right. You guys are still related. Sit over here, sir. You're still related, so you won't argue or fight um, on the way home if one wins and you'll be able to, you guys don't eat this cake. I can tell that by looking at you. You'll have to give this to somebody who needs it. All right, angels. There are a few things I wanna to talk to you about. The Bible says, by the way, and it's, we don't know a lot about angels because we're not really supposed to. People have a tendency to try to worship them if they focus too much on them. But the Bible says that some of us, at least at some point, not all of us, but that some people have actually been around an angel and didn't know it. I think that's really interesting. And some are like, well, I know it wasn't my kids or certainly not my husband or my wife, but some, there's some kind of a, an interaction you could have had with, with an angel. Didn't know why, God knew why. Angel means messenger, God's messenger. Their job is to serve the Lord. There are a few things I wanna to share with you as we get started on our quiz. First, um, angels possess intelligence. They're smart beings that they know things. The second thing is that angels show emotion. I think that's very interesting because you see angels with being passionate, you see angels being angry, they show emotion, but they show emotion under the control of God the Father because they've chosen to serve him and to follow him. Now, you may know the story of, the, uh, of angels. Uh, you may understand you know, all the early events that happened and how Satan fell from heaven. You may not, that's okay. There's plenty of time to talk about these things, but Satan was an angel uh, and, and still is an angel, but he was a good angel and he chose to want to be worshiped like God. And so uh, God kicked him out of, out of heaven and off he went. And there were some evil angels that went with him. There are a whole lot more good angels than or holy angels than evil angels, but they have jobs. But the angels that are holy angels, they serve the Lord. They also interact with us. And I have four pages of notes in your app 
um, that I put together. When I study things, sometimes I go a little crazy with notes. It's just me studying just the notes that I make when I get ready to, to teach or preach. So you, if you download the notes from this week, your PDF on your church app from the app store or the Android store, if you're that kind of person, um, it has these four pages at the end that'll tell you far more than you probably wanna know about angels, but give you some interesting information. Number three, angels have an opinion or a will which I find also to be very, very interesting. They're spiritual beings without physical bodies, but sometimes they take on physical form. We see them take on form of animals. We see them described in scripture in different ways. Certainly not always in human form, but sometimes they look like humans. We always visualize them as humans. And sometimes it's the woman with the blonde hair, right? Or it's the big guy with the flowing brown locks that looks like he goes to the gym a whole bunch. We don't know. Um, angels take on different forms. Um, angels don't have physical bodies, but they still have personalities and they don't know everything, but they probably right now know a whole lot more than we do because they have existed longer than you and I have. And they've been able to experience and observe God for a long, long time. Now, here's three questions that our contestants here are going to answer in a true or false. Now, I don't want to stress you out. The first service, there are a lot of people who got the answers wrong, okay? Uh, and you also can ask the audience and, and you can go off of them if you need a little help. You only can ask this side, and I apologize because this side doesn't look like the sharper side to me. Um, you have the sharper side over here uh, and you can ask them some questions. These are just some simple um, misconceptions perhaps about angels that I uh, just would like to, to lay out there for you uh, so that we can learn a little more and study scripture a little better. First of all, the first question is, this is true or false, okay? 50-50 chance of getting this right, Sean. Um, angels wear halos, true or false? Do angels wear halos? Okay, is that a false? Okay, now, how many of you over here think angels wear halos? Raise your hands if you think angels wear halos, okay? Anybody over here believe that angels wear halos? Angels, that is in fact false. You guys got that right. Angels don't wear halos. Now, you may wonder why or how we, society got the idea that angels wear halos. And even when little kids get in Christmas pageants, we put the little, you know, the wire and the tin foil and the glittery stuff. Well, I don't really want to alarm you, but that came from like a pagan tradition where the pagan priests used to shave their head the, uh, to have a bald spot like some of us have without meaning to and the hair around the sides. And they felt like it made them look more angelic if they stood in certain light and they weren't worshiping God. They were worshiping something totally different. Um, and um, they really began the tradition that angels wear halos and we sort of adopt, adopted it through literature or through uh, art um, way, way back in the day. And it just became sort of folklore and everybody pictures or views an angel with a halo. They don't wear halos. Um, interesting fact. Number two, you, you're great. You got that right. Okay. People, don't put the answers up there. They're putting the answers up. People become angels when we die. True or false? They're answering before you have a chance. Okay, you got, did you already, you knew it? Did you know that or you didn't know that, did you? Yeah. Oh, don't look at the screen. I don't know what's going on with the screen. Yeah. First service, there were people out there. They weren't sure, but they were like, yep, I'm pretty sure. And, and they were, it was mixed. So um, the answer is false. Angels, uh, humans don't become angels after we die. People like to think that because it gives us comfort. Well, grandma's an angel now looking down on me. Um, grandma's probably not looking down on you and she's certainly not an angel. Angels and humans are totally different beings. We're created a totally different way. And right now angels are more powerful than humans are, but in the end, we're gonna have a better job than they do. And the Bible talks a lot about that, but humans, we do not become angels when we die. That's a misconception. Question number three, the third and the final question, and don't look, don't look at the screens. Just look at these people out here. I'm not sure what happened out there. We each have a guardian angel, true or false? Oh, how many over here think we each have a guardian angel? Raise your hand. Okay, there's, do you see that? Now, how many don't think so? Okay, and there's some who just aren't gonna answer. Okay, so you have to decide, what do you got over here? You got false, you don't think so? I wouldn't wanna be yours. Yeah, I'm just kidding, man. Wouldn't it be weird if we had one? That'd be like, yeah, you want to stay outside for this one. Yeah, we wouldn't want the angel following us around. You got true? Okay, you think true? Yeah. All right, very good. I'm glad you answered that way because you're wrong. Um, but, <laughs> but half the congregation believe that too. Yeah. The Bible tells us that um, it doesn't 100% categorically prohibit the idea that perhaps there's a guardian angel, but it certainly leads us to believe that we don't. Um, the passage that most people 
get confused about is this Matthew 18 passage where the Bible uses a couple phrases that if you don't understand the original language, it makes it very confusing for people. Um, See that you do not look down on one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. And what this is talking about is a group of angels and a group of people, not that they're matched up one on one. During that 500 year period between the last prophet and Jesus' birth, the Jews went a little bit crazy about guardian angels and they developed a whole theology about it. The early church fathers picked up this theology and they said, each person's assigned a guardian angel, a good one, and each person's assigned an evil one. And they believed this and the early church fathers taught this, but they were informed by Jewish superstition. And and as they taught this, it sort of validates my growing up experience with Looney Tunes where you had the devil and the angel on your shoulder. You remember that, right? And they would argue with you about what to do and one would poke the other one with a pitchfork. Does anyone else remember that from childhood? Yes, I guess that's where they get it. Not true. Almost certainly we don't have guardian angels. However, angels do guard us from time to time. You need to to download the notes and look because they do many, many things that we would assume a guardian angel would do. The Bible just doesn't tell us that one angel is assigned to one person for life. Very interesting. So download those notes. Next week, we'll have a little moment to talk about angels. And unfortunately, your dad gets the cake, the angel food cake. Dan can have it. Dan can have it? Go ahead and present that to Dan for angel food cake. Thank you, guys. Give him a big hand. Thank you very much. You did a good job. Very good job. After the first service, I had a person suggest, a very creative person, that I should have had an angel food cake for the one who won and a devil's food cake for the one who lost. And had I really been on my toes, I would have done that and bought a devil's food cake. I don't know if Walmart has that or not. And that was the extent of my shopping. So listen, back to the story. We're going to wrap this up very quickly. I do not want to devalue Mary in the least. It was Mary's willingness to be part of this story that ultimately contributed to us having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. What she did and her willingness to be part of God's story was tremendous. And that's one of the reasons that we celebrate her. We do not worship her, but we celebrate her along with the others in the hall of faith. But I want you to be well, well informed about how human her experience was and how it was her willingness to be involved in the highs and the lows for the greater good that gave her an uncommon faith and a power. Let's finish this story up together. How will this be? Mary asked the angel. Now we understand the reason that Mary asked the angel this because um, she was a virgin and she had no idea how this was going to happen. Obvious question, easy to, to ask and understand where she was coming from. And as I've mentioned to you, it's very possible to ask God questions without questioning God. God, I know you're strong enough. I know you're powerful enough. I know you're loving enough and I know you're good enough. I just don't know how. How? Sometimes he tells us, sometimes he doesn't. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she, who was said to be unable to conceive, is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. I am confused. I'm a little scared. I'm a little overwhelmed. This is a lot. But I'm the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left. There it went. And Mary was left trying to figure all of this out. So let's land this plane together. There's a difference between questioning God and asking God a question. And you and I never struggle to make sense of all the good things that happen in our lives. We never ask, oh God, why'd you give me the raise? Oh God, why'd my kids graduate from high school? Oh God, why'd I buy a new company? We never ask about the good things. We always ask and question about the bad things. We think that the bad things can't possibly be part of God's plan, but we know that oftentimes those bad things are just as much a part of God's plan as those good things. But we never seem to question that. And then finally, what if being a part of God's plan means a disruption to my plan? 
Who am I gonna trust? What do I want my life to be about? Verse 37 says, for no word from God will ever fail. It's a little Star Wars-esque in the original language. Sounds a little like Yoda. Not impossible with God is anything. Are you ready to live a life of uncommon faith? Um, I got back from Arkansas a few days ago and Joy and I went down to see Emery, our granddaughter, best granddaughter in the whole world. You can argue if you want to, it's just not gonna work. Uh, we had so much fun watching her, babysitting her. We went to the gym together. We went shopping together. We had a great time. And uh, Arkansas, it's a weird place where my wife, uh, where she has come from. Parts of it don't change at all. And then parts of it are changing so fast that you can't even, can't even keep, keep track. Churches don't change for the most part where joy comes from. Some do. There are a handful, about three, that seem to be pretty contemporary and changing, but there are some that just stay the same. Now, arguably, there's nothing wrong with staying the same. But I was driving past this one church that I drive past all the time when I'm there. It's on my route. And there's a sign. And the kind of signs they have are the kind of signs you put the letters in and you slide the letters in, you know, the, the church signs. And it said, God is up to something new. And I drove past and I looked at the sign and here's what I said. Me, a pastor, a man who's supposed to be a man of uncommon faith. I said, I doubt it. I drove past it the next day. The backside of the sign said the same thing. God is up to something new. So I looked at the church. I slowed down. I'd seen that church a hundred times. I used to live there. Looks the same. The building's the same. Parking lot's the same. It had the same truck parked outside, the same parking place the last time I was there, six months ago, three months ago. God's not up to something new. Drove back a third time. Slowed down in front of the church. Thought about it. Could God be up to something new? The next time I drove past the church, sign's still there. God is up to something new. Well, how would I tell? I would have to go into that church on a Sunday morning and I would have to meet their people. Then I would know if God is up to something new. Because something old is us choosing to live our plan for ourselves the way we see fit and expecting God to bless us or we throw a temper tantrum. But something new, well, it sounds a lot like what Mary said. I'm the Lord's servant. Let it happen to me exactly the way you said. Are you willing to live a life of uncommon faith? Are you willing to let God disrupt your plan for your life to accomplish his plan for your life? Are you just gonna keep going? Perhaps the way you have. And get to the end and look back full of I should haves, I wish I hads, I oughtas and filled with regret. I want 20, 23 to be the best year ever because God's up to something new. And it starts with you and with me saying the same thing that Mary did. I don't know how, but you're God. I'm in. Now, Let's see. Father, thank you for my friends.